kind of color um, investment committee together, and we're really excited to have our, our special guest this morning, um, Tom Steyer. And um, I'm going to just read a little biography. My understanding is, Mr. Steyer, you have a few comments um, after I read your bio, and then we'll have some, some questions. All right, from the board? All right. So um, Mr. Steyer is an investor, philanthropist, and advanced energy advocate, a California business leader, philanthropist, and advanced energy advocate. Before retiring from the private sector, Tom founded and was a senior managing member of Fairlawn Capital Management, LLC. Uh, he's engaged in climate politics through his next-gen climate political organization and works to promote economic development and environmental protection in California and across the country. In 2010, Tom teamed up with former Secretary of State George Shultz to defeat Prop, Prop 23, an effort by out-of-state oil companies to dismantle California's groundbreaking clean energy law, AB 32. In 2010, Tom served as co-chair with Schultz for Yes on Proposition 39, which closed a tax loophole for out-of-state corporations and created jobs for Cal in California. Tom and his wife, Kat uh, Taylor, joined Warren Buffett, Bill and Melinda Gates, and other high-wealth Americans in the Giving Pledge, a promise to donate the majority of their wealth to charitable and nonprofit activities uh, during their lifetimes. Tom and Kat created and funded an Oakland-based beneficial state bank and foundation, which provides loans and banking services to the underserved small businesses and communities and individuals in California along the West Coast. Tom and Kat have four children. So, Mr. Steyer, we're so pleased to have you, and welcome to CalSTRS. Thank you very much for having me. Um, CalSTRS is obviously one of the most influential public pension funds in the country, and particularly because you all represent teachers. You have a specific role. My mother was actually a teacher. So I witnessed firsthand what an impact teachers can have, both on me and my brothers, and I assume also on her students. Um, but I do understand, I hope, the charge to ensure that California's teachers re receive the secure retirement they deserve. Um, I also did take the time to read through your mission statement, and I took from that that you have to secure both the financial future and sustain the trust of the teachers you represent. Um, obviously, economic security and access to education are two of the basic building blocks of what we all want in California and America. and. We want to preserve the future that California's teachers work for and represent their entire careers. And that's the spirit with which I'm going to try to address this question. Um, because I see you'd have a, a financial duty that's very deep to your members and the duty to sustain their trust and support and continue their life's work in society. Um, I, fortunately, I do not think the financial and social returns are mutually exclusive here. Um, and I think I'm going to try to go through this in an orderly fashion and describe each of the points and set up a framework. So rather than telling you what I think the right thing to do is, even though I probably do have an opinion, I'm going to try to set up a framework for thinking about it so you can, I mean, obviously you're going to make up your own minds. And all I'm going to try and do is explain how I think about it in coming to the, in, in thinking through this problem. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I can say about divestment, and I'm sure you guys get asked to divest a lot of things by a lot of people, and it's kind of a blunt instrument, and it's, it, it can be an amorphous process, and hopefully we can come to some clarity about it. I was going to go through, uh, first, what I see is the, uh, the reason to consider divestment, as opposed to just selling a security, why we, you would think of the moral or ethical reason why you'd consider getting rid of a, a, an entire um, group of securities and then go through what I think the financial implications are. So um, I started by saying I thought CalSTRS, had a un CalSTRS has a unique moral authority, which I do. Um, so the first question that you, I would ask uh, in terms of um, any divestment is does the group of companies involved cause substantial harm to society? 
It's the first question. And the second question is, is there a realistic replacement for the service they perform or the product they produce? Um, when I left Farallon, just to uh, be clear, I sold my management stake in the company and asked the firm to remove any investments uh, from my portfolio relating to coal or tar sands. And subsequent to that, I decided that a broader divestment screen was appropriate for me. And so by the end of June 2014, so a year and a half after I left, they'd completed um, the process of removing all fossil fuel investments. Just to give you, so you don't think I, I, I do have a point of view. Um, and as a member of Stanford's Board of Trustees, we also have been, have considered the question about divestment specifically relating to fossil fuels. Um, Stanford does see itself as having a broader duty to society and a mission that we want to carry out beyond simply financial returns when we think about the portfolio. Um, at the same time, Stanford has always wanted to remain consistent in terms of their behavior in society and their portfolio. So in thinking about it, they wanted to do things where they would, if they were going to get rid of something, they wanted to divest it from their life as well as from their portfolio in a consistent way. Um, I do love the line in going through um, your um, statement of mission, social and ethical obligation to require that corporations and entities in which securities are held meet a high standard of conduct and strive for sustainability in their operations. Um, that is part of what the framework that I'm just going to go through very quickly. The second question I did ask was the straightforward investment question. The financial question, you know, what, how to think about cost. I know that you guys have over 800,000 members, and I understand a, more than $190 billion to consider uh, whether it's a good investment. And or is it an investment that would shrink over time? And in going through your investment policy, I also read the following line, which I took really seriously. The success of CalSTRS is linked to global economic growth and prosperity. Actions and activities that detract from the likelihood and potential of global growth are not in the long-term interest of the fund. So one of the things I did was go back and look at the history. Over the last, I know people talk about this, but I want to talk about it in a slightly longer context, but we'll start with the short term. Over the last decade, fossil fuels have basically been a bad bet. For the last, it, we look, we've looked at a couple things over four and a half years. A fossil free index outperformed a complete index by one, over 1% 1 a year over the last four and a half or five years. And over the last 10 years, a billion dollar endowment that was fossil free would have added an additional $109 million in profit. We also went back over 35 years, so back to 1980, to see if there was any time when being invested in fossil fuels was a distinct advantage. And honestly, we couldn't come up with one, but there are certain times when it was a distinct disadvantage. So that the energy sector at, in 1980 was 28% of the S&P 500. And at the end of 2014, it was 8%. So in terms of what the significance, the centrality, the valuation of these businesses in the context of the S&P is down by, you know, over two thirds. And, and when we think about this, when, we, when you guys are thinking about the financial costs and obviously returns are forward-looking. You know, they, I, I've given you a bunch of statistics on the past that said over the last 35 years, you wouldn't have cost you anything to make this decision. But obviously, the past is not the future. One of the issues that I think you're going to, that I think you should at least consider in thinking about the financial implications of this decision is the whole concept of stranded assets. That is there going, are we in fact going to produce all the reserves that fossil, company, fossil fuel companies have on their balance sheets. And you know, the idea here is, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, so I won't dwell on it, and you can ask me a question if there's some part of it that I'm not clear about. The idea is, in looking at how much fossil fuels sovereign countries 
and public companies own, and then trying to translate that into greenhouse gases and looking at the impact of greenhouse gases on change in temperature. If you accept the two degrees centigrade that the, you know, most of the countries in the world have said, if we go beyond that, we're putting ourselves in grave danger. That implies that we can only burn about a quarter to a third of the proved reserves of fossil fuels. And the idea of stranded assets is, well, what, ha what the heck happens to the other two thirds to three quarters that people have on their books that they think are valuable assets? Is it true that we can't produce those? That's the idea of stranded assets. You have an asset. It just not may be an asset that you can turn into cash in the future. Um, in particular, and this is my personal belief, I don't believe it could ever make sense for a big fund, for a, a fund that's over $190 billion, to try and time something in a clever way, to play what I always used to call in the investment world, beat the clock. Like, you know it's a bad idea, but you think it could be a good idea in the short run. I think it's very hard for a very significant fund to try to be a tricky trader. I think that the long-term idea of compounding, where you don't have to trade, where you own something and you rely on the compounded capability of the companies you're investing in is really the only way to really do well when you have a lot of assets to invest. So then the last question on this is, if you come to the conclusion that an asset category like coal causes substantial harm to society and is a poor long-term financial bet, what's the right action? And those, I'm not assuming you come to those conclusions, but I mean, just saying, if you do come to those conclusions, then what is the action you could take? Because there are a couple different things you could do. You could choose to engage with the managements and try and get them to behave differently, or you could choose to divest. And the first question about engagement is something that I know a lot of people take seriously and are considering. Um, I would say the question that I would ask in that case is what would it take to make a fossil fuel company in effect view its business very differently? You're not talking about, you're talking about the, uh, an essential part of what the company does. You're not talking about a change in strategy. You're talking about an entire change in orientation. I think it's a much bigger, they're, you're really talking about a different role within society. So I think it's a very big ask of fossil fuel companies. And I think that if you read the results of the annual reports at some of the biggest um, petroleum companies in the United States from last week, they were very, very reluctant to go along with any kind of change in their <coughs> overall strategic uh, thinking or their relationship to society. So that it, in looking at it, it, they looked very, just reading the papers, they sounded very, very far from really deeply reconsidering that question. I do think that Cal Sturz is a leader on this, on this question and every investment question, partly because of the size and partly because of who you represent. I also think, as somebody who lives in California, we are seeing something very good happen here in terms of the state's push for a clean energy economy, if I can use those words. I mean, we are seeing, we think that there are going to be 500,000 clean energy jobs in California at the end of this year. Um, we do, I understand that this, it, these are very hard questions and that they're big questions and it's kind of a blunt instrument. I know that CalSTRS has a history of making stands when it's something that they, that you guys feel really deeply about, like handguns, like um, South Africa in the 1980s. So I know it's something that you have thought about before and acted on. I know that sometimes you work with CalPERS and I know that they've got that they've got other issues on their hands, including uh, trying to save management fees and cut down on the number of theirs. So they've got lots of things on their plate as well. Um, but that's a different question. I'd like to 
just to finish this so I don't take too much of your time with this opening statement, um, just try and go through what I think the framework is that I tried to cover. I think it comes down to five questions. Does the activity of the company cause substantial harm to society? Is the product or service replaceable? Is it a long-term compounding asset of the type that's appropriate for a very large long-term pension fund? Does engagement with the management hold out the prospect for a, any kind of likelihood of material change to solve the problem? And what is the potential long-term cost to the beneficiaries of the retirement system of divesting? How significant a financial decision are you making? I do believe that CalSTRS can take, can go through those and take a flexible, a long-term flexible view. And I strongly believe that you guys represent something very special. And, you know, you're at the heart of the California dream about our kids and our future. So I'm extremely happy to be here today. And I'm, if I can add anything to what I just said, I'd be very happy to do so. Excellent. So I'm, thank you. Um, we're going to open up to board questions, uh, Mr. Sire. So you have some examples, but you're going to start. You can, I'm the chair. I'm supposed to wait till the end, right? So do you want to jump in, Paul? Sure. Are you guys in the same Stanford class? We, we yeah, we <laughs> we we did go to school together <laughs> many many years ago. <laughs> so thank. You. It wasn't quite that long ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> many many thank years you. ago. <laughs> um, Thank, thank you for coming today, uh, and good to see you in this uh, in this setting. Um, so, you know, very very interesting um, comments. Uh, I, th I thought especially the five points at the end of, of, of that framework. So, I, I want to get your sense on on the question of whether the approach we should be taking is one of doing index investing, but taking certain industries out of our index or whether the approach should be, and these are not mutually exclusive, trying to actively invest <laughs> in new technologies because you're talking about 500,000 green jobs in California. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it, it can be both or it can be just one, but I just your, your thoughts on those two strategies. So, Paul, can I um, take the liberty of rephrasing your question? So the, the way that I'm thinking about answering that question is, is, are you talking about simply avoiding what you would think of as um, investments that cause substantial harm to society, avoiding, or are you advocating positively making investments in um, what you think of as clean tech investments, which have possibly a benefit to society which is not reflected in the bottom line? Is that fair? Well, I, uh, yeah. There are the two approaches, but I think you know we are we are we are we, we are supposed to be to have a a, a well diversified portfolio. Uh, it's kind of stated in our state constitution that that's that that's the way we carry out our function as a as a, as a, <coughs> as a pension fund. So we have to come to the conclusion that a, that a diversified portfolio m minus. Um, uh, Energy companies or uh, fossil fuel companies is is the right way to be uh, diversified, mm -hmm. um, but in in some ways that seems to me to be an easier step to take than to then say we can figure out which alternative energy technologies are right. going to work. So, well, let me say I agree with you because when I was reading through and trying to understand Calster's charge from its members and beneficiaries. It seemed to me that securing their financial future is something that's absolutely preeminent. And in looking at those numbers and going through those five questions I asked you, right, that I posed for you and for myself in thinking about any one of these questions, the question was, could you have a well-diversified portfolio where you were not giving up substantial uh, gains and also divest from a class of stocks, say coal stock, 
coal producers. And looking historically and also thinking out in the future, I think the answer is actually yes to that. It's a different question from can you then find good clean tech investments as a special category that would keep up with the risk reward profile you want for your beneficiaries as active managers. That is something that you could examine, but forcing a, a huge fund to put money into that is something I honestly don't know whether that would meet your financial requirements, and I think that's a separate question. And I think that that's one which would require a different framework than I gave you. I was really giving you a framework for how I would think about the first question you ask, which is, can we come up with a well-diversified portfolio that doesn't consider absolutely every industry in the world? And I think the answer to that, honestly, is yes. I think the answer, and I think in the, it, it would have actually made you money over the last 35 years to do that. I think the second question is one which you'd have to do the work and it'd be an investment, it's an active investment and you'd have to look investment by investment and I can't tell you where you'd come out honestly, Paul. Okay. That's very helpful, thank you. Thank you. I had a question, I guess, with respect to the latter of your consideration and it has to do with um, I guess where pension funds were about a decade ago relative to investing in clean energy. And um, the experience uh, back then showed um, relatively poor performance from these investments, so it's really created a bit of a chill with respect to uh, proceeding um, in uh, committing additional capital. Where do you see um, the next round of profitable clean energy investments coming from? And if you have a global perspective about that, that'd be great. But uh, and then um, how should we be, I guess, responding to uh, concerns about the profitability of clean energy? I mean, that's still very much the case <coughs> around this whole industry. You know, it is my, I, I've always believed that when you're making specific investments, Betty, you're really looking at specific, the specific details of, of that, you know, individual company. And when I, so I can understand very well why the promises of 10 years ago didn't come true in terms of clean tech. And I think people were uh, betting on a revolution that was going to happen faster than it actually has happened. So when I think about clean tech, and I've thought about it too, um, I see it as a business and a movement that is going to surprise us all. And, you know, I think people tend to think that we can look 30 years out and this is going to happen, but I would keep in mind the telecommunications and information technology revolution because I don't think anyone knew how the internet would develop. I think before 1996, people didn't really even know that the internet was going to be the thing that was going to change so much of society. So that in thinking about clean tech investments, I, I, I really feel as if it's going to go in ways that, I'm going to, I'll give you an example, it's going to go in ways that none of us expect. And therefore, in thinking about the companies, I think you've got to think about them. I tend to think about them personally in terms of how sure are you of the revenues because I think this is a business where if there's been disappointment in clean tech, it's because they've had products that looked really interesting and those products didn't turn into revenues. And if you know anything about businesses, revenues are nice. In fact, they're more than nice. They're completely essential. And I think that's been the disappointment. But when I think about how clean tech is going to work. I don't think it's necessarily going to w work the way it's commonly expected. So I think a lot of people, and I'm one of them, think that there's going to be a huge move in solar. I expect that will happen, honestly. But I'm not sure. And I think two things that people don't expect, I think that there's going to be a huge move within energy saving, energy efficiency, related to information technology. I don't think we understand yet how powerful a tool IT is going to be in energy. 
And I think that's something which could be really amazing. The second thing is on the way up here, I was talking to somebody telling me how much material savings, how much energy savings, how much greenhouse gas could be saved by completely new manufacturing technologies. No one is talking about new, that's something, and he was talking about a complete revolution. And I don't say that from the point of view of saying he's definitely right, but I'm saying that we have 317 million Americans, 38 million Californians who are very inventive. And some of them are really gonna surprise us. So in thinking about it from an investment standpoint, if you, if you liken it to communications, there's no way that you could know which way the communications revolution was gonna happen. And I think here, you kind of know where we have to get to in terms of emissions, but exactly how that works is something that it's hard to see. So I think, I tend to think about this from a very old fashioned investment standpoint which is in, in positive investments, you're either, you know, you really have to concentrate a lot on the human beings involved in the revenue. And I think, you know, I think CalSTRS is very well positioned to make smart, active bets, but I wouldn't separate this in terms of how I think about it from the way you do the rest of, the way you rest, invest the rest of your money. Okay. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Mr. Steyer, thank you for being here. Um, you know, the difficulty is, is uh, when we have the ability to uh, interact with someone like yourself is to how do you really narrow down uh, a question or a thought and extract as much, if I can use that term, extract, uh, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, if, if we can extract as much information and knowledge from you <coughs> as we possibly can. Um, earlier this year, we had one of our managers in front of us, and, and their uh, famous for saying, you know, this, this, their philosophy is a, a, values pro, a value proposition, not a values proposition. And they have served us quite well. And based upon your comments uh, about our moral authority, and then also your comments around the value proposition, it sounds as if you believe it's both a value and a values proposition. Um, but I don't want to really go down that track of thinking. And I think also your comments in response to Ms. Xi about the velocity of change and innovation that's taking place now. Um, change has been, it's, a, it's, it's inevitable since the beginning of humanity. But the velocity of which change is taking place now, I think is unprecedented. And that's uh, what's very exciting and chal exciting, challenging, uh, at the same time will create, I think, tremendous opportunities for long-term investors. Um, but having said all of that, I really would like your thoughts and views around the ideas as policymakers uh, with 58% of our portfolio is in the equity bucket, uh, the majority of which is passively managed. To what extent would you s encourage a large institutional investor and our staff to adopt a policy where they carve, we would carve out a piece of the equity bucket into a passively managed <coughs> index fund that is fossil free. So let, let me make sure I, can I rephrase the question again so I can make sure I answer it? 58% of your, of your asset base is in equities and a, a large proportion of that is index based. Which makes total sense to me, by the way. So I'm totally by that. Um, and the question is, of the part that is index-based, or the part, or the active part, how much of it of that would make sense to be fossil-free or coal-free, yeah. which is what Stanford did. Right to adopt a policy uh, where we direct our staff to say, you know, take a piece of that bucket and let's let's dip our toes in the, there a little bit, and uh, based upon the data that you've provided anecdotally and the stuff that's in the record about new sources of energy, the percentage that's part of the S&P, the performance, to say that maybe this isn't really a good bet going forward and, you know, it's a risk to stay in that investment. So <coughs> Chris and you, your staff create a, a little passively managed index fund. Let's monitor it. Let's run it at a really low cost and be completely out of, in that portion of it, be fossil free. So here's what I'd say. There are two questions here, which I was trying to outline at the beginning. I mean, there are five, there, there, I tried to give you a framework of five points, but they're basically two questions. 
The first is, why would you consider it from a moral standpoint? And the second is, from a financial standpoint, what are the implications? And I think you're asking me the second question. From a financial standpoint, how risky is this? Because the less risky it is to the, to the fund, then the higher proportion of that 58% you could do fossil free. So I would say two things. Let's separate coal and then let's separate fossil fuels and I'll, I'll, I'll address them separately if you don't mind. It's hard for me to believe that coal is gonna help your fund. Full stop. It's very hard for me to believe because it's very hard for me, it's just not that big a percentage and it's very hard to look at that business and see it as a growth business that's going to compound over decades. So when you think about what would make a difference to over $190 billion, you'd need to have something that compounded over a long period of time at a good rate, a better rate than the rest of your portfolio to make any difference whatsoever. It's very hard to see that as a risky decision. Because it, it, you know, for, for the size that it is, on a, on a just the mathematical basis, it would have to have explosive growth to make a difference. And it's hard for me to envision a, a scenario where coal had an explosive growth in the United States of America. Second question, fossil fuels. If you look at 35 years, <laughs> there's been no time where it's been very risky. So the question then becomes, under what circumstances are you taking a risk looking forward? You have 35 years that says it's not risky. If, any, if anything, it's going to make you, you're going to do better. But the question is, what would change that scenario? What would change a scenario where the risk of not owning it from a financial basis becomes significant? I think, I think it's the question you're asking me. It's 8% of the S&P at the end of 2014. Probably less now since it's probably gotten whacked this year. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's, so it's one twelfth of the S&P, roughly. The way that it could outperform over a short period of time <clears throat> is for it to, for the underlying commodity price to go up a lot. You know, over a short period of time, that could make the stocks as proxies for, um, for the commodity price do well in the short run if investors thought that the price rise was not only significant but sustainable. Over a long period of time, you'd have to have that price compound at a very substantial rate. And there were times in the 1970s when these things, when people were using price decks for petroleum going forward that were truly extraordinary. Because I was looking around, Paul and I were at least old enough to have been there. Maybe one or two of the other people I'm looking at. <laughs> so that's the only other way that it could be significant. And if you ask me whether that's likely in the world that we're looking at, I would say, no, <laughs> I don't think it's, that's a likely scenario, that the price of oil skyrockets and people think it's going to stay up there. Because I think the day the price of oil skyrockets is the day that everything that can substitute for oil becomes much more attractive. And I think that every renewable becomes, becomes you know, twice, outperforms that day. So the likelihood that we see, you know, some sort of skyrocketing oil price that's sustainable where there isn't substitution from, I, I think something else is going on, which is this. I think that we've had, for 100 years, we've been betting on fossil fuel prices. And fossil fuel prices are dependent on the cost of extracting fossil fuels. And right now, when you look at oil, oil's the biggest commodity. So all the other commodities in the world don't add up to oil. When you think about, the, the reason they always quote the oil prices is because that's the price that matters. So when you think about oil prices, they've gone up over time about 2% a year. But if you think about where we're talking about drilling for oil now, we're talking for drilling for oil in the Arctic. Well, one thing you should know about the Arctic, it's not cheap. It's very deep. It's cold. It's far away. It's expensive. Getting the oil out of the Arctic is really expensive. So the question is, that we're talking about the cost of extracting fossil fuels compared to the cost of producing renewable fuels. Producing renewable fuels is on a decline curve. It's like every manufacturing or technological process you've ever heard of. It's not as good as Moore's law, the cost of producing semiconductor chips. 
that went, that went you know, in half every year and then it went down by 50%. It, it's something where the cost of producing renewable energy, the cost of producing solar energy, wind energy, geothermal, is gonna go down every year. Just the way the cost of manufacturing anything improves because people do it better. Every single year they come up with new innovations, new procedures to make it cheaper. I think the rule of thumb that I would use just, and this is not directly relevant necessarily to oil prices, every time they've doubled the installed base of solar energy in the world, the cost has come down 24%. So the cost of solar is gonna continue coming down. So when I ask what is the risk that fossil fuels go up a lot and therefore the price of the securities goes up a lot, people expect those prices to remain and for all of those assets to be produced, that the stranded asset theory turns out to be completely false, it's hard for me to imagine. Because I think we now are in a world where the competition is on a decline curve that is inexorable. That is human and technology based, that gets bet, we're, we're now betting on human ingenuity, a lot of times Californian ingenuity, against going to the very, very end of the earth to find fossil fuels. So when I think about risk, look, I care about you know, investment, and I'm 100% fossil fuel free. Thank you very much uh, for coming with us. Um, in my neck of the woods, there's a lot of trees. And um, timber sales have dramatically dropped, but one of the ideas that's being bannered about is biomass. And going into forests that, if you thin the forest, use the extra material to create energy through, and I, I'm not anywhere near <coughs> fluent in, in how this all happens. But if you take the materials that you use from the forest when you're thinning forests out to make our forests more healthy, to be able to sustain some of the um, things that attack them, forest fires, uh, insect infiltration, that type of thing, and <coughs> use that for fuel, it seems that that also creates a problem, but that is a huge uh, topic in the Pacific Northwest, so I'm wondering if you have any opinions on that. Well, like you, I am no expert in biomass, so I'm going to give you some answers that are more broad-based than specific, so I'll apologize in advance for that. No, that's, that's, thank you. The way that I think about all of those questions is a question of measurement, in the sense that what we're really trying to produce is the best product for the cheapest price. And what we want to do, including in that word cheapest, is all the costs. So that one of the things that I know is going to be critical over the next 30 years is how we treat our forests, how we treat our agriculture, how we raise crops, how we raise animals, and how we treat our open spaces. And I actually think that they're going to be a great source of opportunity for our country to do a better job. And in order to measure that and to do that better job, we're going to actually have to be able to measure some of the questions you were referring to that we aren't measuring right now. And that's one of the reasons I thought IT would be such a big deal. Because getting data on this and understanding what that's going to mean from a, a traditional environmental standpoint, the health of the land, and a, and a greenhouse gas standpoint is a measurement thing that we can do and that I think we're going to end up doing very efficiently and exactly. But there's no doubt in my mind that the great spaces of the country, like forests, like big agricultural uh, ranges, are going to be used in different ways and better ways to store and sequester carbon and to produce energy more efficiently. So one of the things that I really believe is that the people who own forests, the people who 
live around forests are going to be a big part of the answer, and our society is going to end up in some way, shape, or form compensating them for that service. But in order to determine the best way for that to happen, the measurement and understanding of the implications of everything we do is going to have to be a lot more exact and, and quantifiable so people can make the best decisions with all the information. That's actually, I know that's a somewhat vague thing, but no, it's... Actually, from the presentations that I've heard, it, 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 it follows the same type of path. We're, we're, and it's... it's, and it's uh, I really funny. believe that it, the, the whole point, if you think about what's going on in the world in terms of innovation, an awful lot of it has to do with taking different disciplines, whether it's forestry or biology or chemistry or human behavior, and getting big data associated with it and quantifying so we're no longer guessing what works and taking that information technology and big data along with the traditional disciplines and coming up with new conclusions and new behaviors. And I think that's what's going to happen in our forests. And I think it's going to be good for the land. And I think it's going to be good for the people up there. And I think it's going to be good for the state and the country. Thank you. Tom. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, kind of a two-part question, and I'll, I'll preface it by saying I'm probably as skeptical or more than you about engagement with oil companies or uh, uh, on uh, as a path to social change. That said, I was really struck, I guess it was yesterday, by the report that the five big European oil companies all uh, endorsed yeah. uh, carbon tax. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wondered if you'd comment on that, and then also more generally uh, on the importance of placing a price, either by tax or cap and trade, on carbon in uh, creating a, a, a more sound energy environment. Great. Um, first, with regard to the six European, it was six. And it was a couple of weeks ago. And it was incredibly heartening, I agree with you. Basically, for those of you who didn't read the story, six companies, including Shell, BP, Total, ENI, I'm going to forget the other two, and I'll apologize. But they were huge yeah. oil companies in Europe. Came out and said, we want to be part of the, we accept the idea that human behavior is causing climate change, that it's a threat to society. We want to be part of the solution and part of a civil society dealing with it responsibly. We think the best way to do that is a carbon tax. And so we're proposing one. Have Now, it's also true, which you, that was in the paper, but what hasn't been in the paper to nearly the same extent is that Exxon privately says the same thing. You know, they want to be also, to, it, to their credit, would like to be, you know, contributing positive members of society. They see themselves that way absolutely as responsible members of the American, you know, hum, you know the American people want to do a good job and recognize all the things they said. They didn't sign on to that, and they were asked. So I think it, it, American companies are not in the same position as European companies. They, they don't deny it, but they don't want to propose it. I think that at the same time, I think a lot of oil companies feel as if they can survive this, that they a lot of them use a shadow price for carbon in making their investments. They assume there's going to be some sort of price put on it and that therefore in thinking in running out their price decks going forward and thinking about production and buying <coughs> reserves and developing reserve, that they're going to have to pay a price on carbon and that they shouldn't do things that won't be profitable, assuming it's true. But there are not American oil companies taking that position. In fact, they've refused to take that position of advocating that and becoming part of a society-wide discussion about how best to effectuate that. That's partly a reflection of where American society is versus European society. You know, I think in California, we, do, we live in one of 50 states. It's the biggest state. We speak to each other a lot. We like each other. <laughs> We think we're doing a good job, and you know I can show you all the growth statistics and why California does do a good job. But there are other states that see it really, really differently. And in the United States, this is you know if you read 
the stories coming out of Washington, D.C., you can see that this is still a hotly contested issue in the halls of the Senate and the Congress. So I think that's why European oil companies are making a different statement than American oil companies, because they're in a different context and one where if they didn't do that, they would think themselves outside this sort of acceptable range of society, whereas in the United States, that's not true. That's the first thing I'd say. Secondly, the question about a price on carbon in general. The reason that I would like a price on carbon or that I think it's a smart idea is exactly what I was saying before when it came to trees, culling trees, biomass. What we're doing now when we put in subsidies for anything is we're saying we want to make this industry, this competitive uh, over these period of years. What we're not saying is how much we should be supporting this versus this. You know, I started by saying to Betty that I thought this was going to be unpredictable. That if you have 38 million Californians or 300 million Americans coming up with new ideas, they're going to surprise us all. I really believe that. The good thing about a price on carbon is everybody comes on a level playing field. So if you have a great manufacturing idea and it saves a ton of carbon, then you get that's put into the computer model that produces a return from your invention. And if somebody else has a great invention that makes solar more efficient so that we go from kind of a 20% efficiency rate to a 30% efficiency rate, then the, co then the benefit to society goes into that computer program on a level playing field with your invention. And the cost of any fossil fuel to society is included. So when people think about the cost, they include all the costs. That's why the reason I like a price on carbon is when we do it industry by industry, we're in effect doing a vertical decision that we want to support wind or we want to support solar. The great thing about a cost on carbon, it's kind of horizontal. Everybody's on the same playing field. It's level. So everybody gets to compete and make decisions you know, just based on a, bo a bottom line that's fair. And that's why what we're really trying to do is say, include the cost to society that we're incurring by your behavior, and then make your own decisions. And if you want to pay for, you know, I, I think of it as just straightforward pollution. If you want to pollute, if you want to take your garbage and throw it into the town square, and it costs us 10 bucks to pick it up, just give us the 10 bucks, or maybe we'll make it 11 so that we, you know, disincent it a little. But we're saying, make it even so society doesn't care what it is. And you can make your own decisions. And we can all you know, just try and maximize based on full information. Any other questions from board members? I, go ahead, Harry. I, I would just like your opinions on, on whether or not um, for, I, I'm, I try to monitor generational issues. Uh, for, for whatever reason, I'm intrigued by uh, change that takes place across generations. And to what extent do you, from your view, um, do you believe this quote unquote movement is actually something that's generational and is um, essentially not going to stop? It, it, to the contrary, it may only uh, accelerate. And I raise that only because of uh, my work with young people. And the questions that I ask them uh, often gives me great insight to how uh, people look at issues very differently depending upon their age and what's important to them. And it seems to me there's a lot of momentum around this issue. So there are a couple things I would say about that. One is. I say that having, uh, I should know. I live in Santa Monica, so you know, <laughs> that movement may be skewed. It might not be the same in Kansas. <laughs> yeah, I was the momentum say. might not be as strong. So, a, so a, a typical small town in America is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unique. So I say that there are blinders. <laughs> well, let me say this: I have four children between the ages of 21 and 27, so my exposure to millennials is constant and deep. Um, I would also say one thing that I did not know that. In 2016, a third of the electorate is going to be millennials defined as people under 35. 
which is a, this is bigger than the baby boom. This is really going to be the big uh, bulge in the American electorate for a long time. Second point is, I think when people think about energy and climate, they think of it as something that's not going to happen in the short term. I mean, regardless of how many extreme events, regardless of the drought in California, no matter how much Californians worry about drought, we don't think, and the people in Texas don't think when they have drought or floods that, oh my gosh, you know, it's really here. They continue to think of it as something that is in the future. For people under 35, they definitely think it's part of their life. For, pe for some older people, they may think that it's not going to affect them and therefore it's not their responsibility. But for people under 35, I don't think any of those people think that they're not going to live through the impact of whatever we do now. And they're right. I, I happen to think that the urgency is much higher and that the people in this room are going to experience, I think we're experiencing the impact of climate change and that it's something which will get more significant. So when I think about why generations are treating this differently, and we've done a lot of study of this to try and understand how people of different ages in the United States think about this, younger people know that this is their life and that they're going to live this trajectory however it goes. And in terms of momentum and not going to stop, the only way this will stop is if all the scientists are wrong. That's the only way this can stop, because as long as the impact seems to grow, as long as the projections continue to be what they are or worse, then people who are worried about living on the planet Earth are going to worry about this, and they're going to worry more. And I think that their ability to accept the status quo is going to go down because they're going to look at it and think, oh my gosh, you know, regardless of when you think it's unbearable, it's always going to be closer until we get to a place where we're on a different trajectory. So when I think about this, the only way this stops is for the scientists to be wrong. And if you look at the facts that are not projections, but look at what's going on physically in the world, it is really hard to believe that both the facts and the scientists are wrong. You can, the reason that they're drilling in the Arctic is there's no ice in the Arctic. That didn't just happen. You know, they're, they're projecting no ice in the Himalayas by 2100. You can climb Everest on rock. So something is happening. Something is changing. And those are not things that are, you know, subject to debate. So the question is, what would make people think that we were on a trajectory that was sustainable? That we're on a trajectory where they're going to be able to live their lives in, a, in an environment that supports them and their family to go about their business in a prosperous and happy way and could try and live out the dream that California's teachers are trying to make them prepared for. That's really the question. You know, what is going to let them pursue the American dream safely. Until they're sure of that, I can't imagine why people would stop worrying about it because it seems to me something really worth worrying about. Mr. Sire, I know you need to be out of here at 12 and it's a little after 12. Chris, did you have anything else you wanted to add or? No, I think we've covered just about everything <laughs> we had on our list. <laughs> really appreciate your time and thanks for helping us grapple. Obviously, we're we're literally grappling with mm -hmm. these issues right now, and so I really appreciate your your thought and your leadership in our state. And um, thanks so much for your time. Well, I, I would like to say I do really think that Californians' large pension funds, like CalSTRS, are national and international leaders, and I really am proud of what you guys have done over the past decades. So I think you should. You know, I think you have a high charge, and I think you've done a very good job with it, and I think we all appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.